Java's type system is actually split into two branches. There's classes and interfaces, which are called reference types, and then there are what are called the primitive types. The eight primitive types are very similar to the base types in C, and many of them in fact have the same name, though they're not always exactly the same. So for example, in Java, an int is a 4-byte signed integer, and it's always a 4-byte signed integer. There's no such thing as an unsigned int, and this definition of int does not vary depending upon the platform the way it does in C. Whereas a char in C is a single byte integer, in Java it's always a two byte integer and it's always unsigned. This is because when Java was created, Unicode was beginning to take over the world, and at the time the most popular encoding, and the one used by Java predominantly, was uh, what's called UCS2, which uses two bytes per character. In truth, this was a bit of a screw up because, as you know, uh, not all Unicode characters can be encoded into two bytes. So when dealing with Unicode text in Java, you can't necessarily just put any character into a char. Still, a char is what's most commonly used when you want to store a single character. One other major difference from C is that Java has a proper explicit Boolean type. Rather than using the value 0 to represent false and all other numeric values to represent true, in Java we have an actual value called true and an actual value called false, and those are the two Boolean values. In fact, in the condition of an if statement or a while statement, the condition expression must evaluate into Boolean. It can't evaluate into, say, an int or a byte or any other kind of numeric value. It has to be a proper Boolean. So these are the types we most commonly use when we deal with numbers, but the question is what if you need arbitrary precision? Like say, what if double precision floating point isn't accurate enough or doesn't have a big enough range? Well, for such purposes, there are some classes in the standard library called big decimal and big integer, which can represent respectively uh, arbitrarily sized decimal numbers and arbitrarily sized integers. When you use these classes, though, because they are reference types and not primitive types, you can't use the standard operators. Like, say, you can't use a plus sign to add one big integer to another big integer. You have to invoke on the big integer object uh, the method called add and pass to it the other big integer object. So it, it ends up looking really clumsy and doesn't look like math at all. In truth, though, as I've discussed before, it's actually really quite rare in programming that we really truly need arbitrary precision and arbitrary magnitude numbers. It just doesn't come up very often except in a few domains. Like say in code having to do with financial stuff, that is a case where you'll want to use big decimal because it's not acceptable to get any rounding error the way you usually get when you use floating point numbers. In the large majority of programming though, these primitive types serve us just fine. There are a few critical differences between the primitive types and what are called the reference types, which includes classes and interfaces. When we declare a variable which has the type of a reference type, that variable is a reference variable. It holds a reference, an address. The actual objects themselves are located somewhere else on the heap. A reference variable just holds the address of where that object is located. In contrast, a variable which is a primitive type is a value variable. It holds the value itself in the variable. So if we declare a variable int i and assign it a value, that value is stored directly in i. We don't store the address of that value, we store the value itself directly in the variable. Another major difference is that when you use the equality operator with reference types, what you are actually testing is identity. So if we have two references, x and y, and we use the equality operator with them, what we are actually asking is, does the reference x and the reference y, do they point to the very same object in memory? If x points to one object and y points to another, it doesn't matter for the purpose of this test what they look like in memory. They could both look exactly the same in memory, but they're still two separate objects, so an identity test in this case would return false. In contrast, when we use the equality operator on primitive types, it's actually testing for equality. So if we use the equality operator with two int variables a and b, we'll get back true as long as their values are equivalent. So in fact, a and b don't even have to be the same type. One, say, can be an int, and the other could be, say, a float. 
if the int value is 3 and the float value is 3.0, well those are equivalent, so the equality test would return true. Finally, when we cast reference types, we're either doing an upcast or a downcast, and neither of these kinds of casts really convert the value in any sense. It's just that we are satisfying the compiler and telling it that yes, this object is a suitable stand-in for this type. In contrast, when we cast a primitive type, it's much more like a cast in C. You can think of the cast as actually producing a new value. So consider this example, where we've declared an int variable named i, and assigned it the initial value 60, and we've declared a float variable named f, and assigned it the initial value 5.4. Well, if we want to assign the value of f to i, we first have to cast it into an int. And you should think of this as an operation. We are taking f and applying it the cast to int operator and getting back a new int value, which is then assigned to i. And in this particular case, the cast produces a distortion because 5.4 isn't a valid int value, so it has to be truncated to an integer. So the cast to int here actually returns the value 5. In the next line, it's the same idea going the other way. To assign the value of i to f, we have to cast from an int to a float. So here the cast operation returns the value 5.0, and that's what gets assigned to f. Now there are some cases where the cast from one primitive type to another can be left implicit. We don't have to explicitly write the cast. These implicit casts are allowed in the cases where the cast couldn't possibly distort the value. So say, if we have an int variable i with the initial value 5, and a byte variable b with the initial value 3, well, if we want to assign the value of i to b, we have to explicitly cast to a byte. But conversely, if we want to assign the value of b to i, we don't. The reason for this double standard is that all possible byte values are all valid int values, but not all int values are valid byte values. A byte in Java is just a single signed integer, so it has the values from negative 128 to positive 127. An int is a 4-byte signed integer, so it has the value of negative 2 billion something up to positive 2 billion something. And so most int values we can't accurately store in a byte. We have to do some kind of violence to the value to make it fit. And in fact, what Java will do when you cast an int to a byte is that it will simply truncate. It will hack off the front three bytes out of the four. And the value of that remaining byte is what gets returned by the cast to type byte. Again, you may notice here that the compiler is being lazy because any human can look at this code and say that, ah, i has the value 5 when this cast is done, therefore it is going to be a valid byte value. No violence is going to be done to the value. So a really smart compiler could look at this code and say, there is no possibility of violence to the value when we cast it to a byte, so therefore I'm not going to require you to make the cast explicit. But the compiler doesn't do that kind of analysis, and for good reason. It's very expensive to do, and it only works in basically trivial cases, because in real code you have branches, and the branching might depend upon something that happens at runtime, uh, something which simply can't be determined ahead of time at compile time. So it would just be a waste of energy on the compiler's part, and not really much help if it tried to figure these cases out for you. It would be a lot of effort for just a very trivial gain.